Some time ago, I was sent this rather interesting email from uh, one of our friends here at Colonial. They had pulled it off somewhere, and they had uh, passed it on to me. It goes like this. I am hereby officially tendering my resignation from the rat race. I have decided I would like to go back and take on the carefree life of a six-year-old once again. I want to go to McDonald's and think it's a four-star restaurant. I want to stuff my mouth with chewing gum and see who can blow the biggest bubble. I want to think M&Ms are better than money because you can eat them. Uh, I don't want to change clothes because they get dirty. And I want to enjoy every day like vacation. I want to go back to a time when life was simple. I want to be excited about you know little things like my new Hot Wheel or a new jump rope. I don't want my day to consist of computer crashes and paperwork and cleaning and, and children and chores and news reports and, and aches and pains. So I am resigning from it all. Here's my checkbook and my car keys, my credit card bills, my pager, my cell phone. Oh, wait, let me keep that. But here's my fax machine and my mortgage book. I am officially resigning from the pressures of life. If you want to discuss this further with me, you'll have to catch me first, so see you later, alligator, after a while, crocodile. Besides, tag, you're it, and you've got cooties. <laughs> so I'm out of here. <laughs> well, you know as well as I do that life can't go back there, and it isn't simple. Eventually, you realize that cooties weren't real, but mortgage payments are. According to scripture, it's interesting that peace and tranquility and simplicity of life are things that we might automatically think are things relegated to a simpler time. What I want to show you in a little bit is the, the fact that every believer is actually to pursue peace, tranquility, simplicity. Not running from trouble, but trusting God in the midst of of trouble. Not avoiding grief or difficulty, but finding God to be sufficient and satisfying in the midst of it. One of the chief characteristics of a believer's life that I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on is quietness, tranquility. In fact, Isaiah spoke for God who described the world this way because we're not in a peaceful world, are we? It's frantic and unsatisfied. He said this, There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. The wicked are like the tossing sea. It cannot be quiet. The world cannot be quiet. This isn't just the noisy distractions, you know, and traffic and horns and schedules. This is turmoil even between neighbors and nations. In fact, I have read that in the last 5,000 years of world history, there have been at least 14,000 major wars. In fact, I further read that in just the last 400 years in Western civilization, there have been at least 8,000 different peace treaties signed. And the duration of them averages less than 24 hours months in length. Our own capital is filled with monuments and memorials to peace. We build them after every war. Domestic violence, terrorism, I, the world is simply rife with unrest. It is, like Isaiah said, like the tossing of the waves on a tempestuous sea, unable to find peace. Listen, beloved, the truth remains that they can't. Jesus Christ is described by the prophets as the prince of what? Peace. You can't have peace without the prince. You deny the prince, you deny the potential for peace. Which is why the gospel is referred to by the way, is the gospel of peace. The believer who shares the gospel is described as having put on uh, uh, shoes that are the preparation of the gospel of peace, Ephesians 6, 15. The gospel is really a declaration to our world that a peace treaty has been ratified in the blood of Christ. We heard the choir sing about him paying the ransom. 
with his blood. We offer that to the world and we say, look, here's the peace treaty you can have with God. It's already signed in the name of Christ by his own blood. Paul informs the believers living in Colossae of these wonderful words. He says, it's the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Christ and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1.19. Listen to the benefits. Paul writes that Jesus Christ came and preached peace to you who were far away. That was his message. He preached peace. Here's how to have peace with God. So now then, you have access by one spirit to the Father. Wonderful text on the Trinity, by the way. Peace with God the Father by means of the Spirit through the work of Christ. See, now you can have peace with God through Jesus. You can have the peace of God. In fact, Isaiah said, to, to paraphrase it, he said that God will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him, anchored to him. In other words, peace isn't found in the lack of responsibilities or, or mortgage payments or pressures or chores. Peace is related not to the absence of external pressures, it is related to an internal priority. To paraphrase Isaiah's quote, we, we keep our minds anchored on God and then we find peace. What that means is that this thing called peace isn't found in the absence of trouble or grief. It's found in the presence and friendship of God. Here's where it gets interesting for the Christian to me. In fact, we move a step beyond that. Peaceful relations isn't just between the believer and God. Peaceful relations is between the believer and the believer. We've dealt with this already in some of these promises we've been covering. It happens to be something we actually offer others in the body, the local assembly. And it's something we offer the world. And so here we are at the end of five months, can't believe it, five months of studying our new church covenant that's part of our new constitution and bylaws. We've broken that down into these 19 promises. Promises related to our private life, promises related to our church, and promises related to the community. We're gonna cover the last one today, and here it is. To pursue peace, this is our promise, demonstrating humility, dignity, and tranquility in the arena where God has appointed us. Now that might sound odd to our ears. In fact, I think the church uh, tends to focus on the implications of having peace with God and we have rehearsed that having the peace of God and we have definitely focused on that but if you ransack the scriptures with in this regard you'll discover that peace is is actually something believers do offer to other believers Ephesians 4 3 says we are to be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace in other words, peace in a local church is not automatic. It isn't guaranteed. It's something to be pursued. To the Roman Christians, Paul wrote, So then pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another, Romans 14, 19. And by the way, that chapter, Romans 14, the context is, is doubtful things, things that don't get you to heaven or send you to hell. It's just those issues in life where the Bible isn't perfectly clear. Some of those, some of those gray areas where you have to make your own standard conviction related to the Spirit of God in your own particular life. But in that context, Paul says, pursue peace. In other words, you might disagree on some of these elements, where you're going to send your kids to school and what you might watch and where you might go on vacation and what school you might use and, and what translation you might use and, and, and a host of other things. Pursue peace in those doubtful areas. The word for pursue is a hunting word from the first century world. You could translate it to hunt it down. Hunt peace down. Track it down. Follow hard after it. Press forward on its trail. In other words, do whatever you have to do to make peace with the other believers around you. This doesn't refer, by the way, in any way, shape, or form to sacrificing the truth. We speak the truth, yet in love. It doesn't mean compromising on moral standards of purity. Paul is talking about gray areas of life where the Bible doesn't speak to the issue. So be the kind of person 
that for the most part, especially in the church where we all agree doctrinally, you still be the one in those areas of doubt where you carry that peace treaty around in your pocket. You're ready to, you're ready to hand it to people. Your, your name's already signed. Be a peacemaker as you deal with other Christians. Now, we've heard all that. We know all that. And I have certainly preached on that, even in the context of these promises. But I want to go one step further. I want to preach on a subject I don't think I've ever heard a sermon preached upon. What about offering peace to our world, our community? Is that really a promise we're to make? Well, Paul writes it this way. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Now he's gone beyond the church. He's talking about everybody. Be at peace with all men. That's a startling command. When you consider the fact that Paul is writing that to believers living directly under the reign in the very physical presence of Nero. Might sound ludicrous to them. Christians during this period of time were an endangered species and there wasn't any government agency to try to help them survive. They were on their own. Of course, trusting in the Lord. But Rome, as we've already studied in this series, has, has, is imploding in, in bloodlust and immorality and idolatry and fantasize, greed, uh, deception, outright lunacy, from the emperor's throne on down. In fact, when Paul wrote this, Nero had already poisoned Britannicus, a 13-year-old that he viewed as a threat to his throne. And he had him killed. He had already had his mother put to death. She was also considered a rival. And then he puts on this lavish funeral and the sham uh, uh, exposure of grief for her. He revived the laws of treason, which basically allowed him the ability to put to death anybody that he could claim was treasonous. And what he did was send everybody in his family into a terror and his friends and the Senate and certainly wealthy individuals who lived in the empire because he would have them killed to take their, their property. Can you imagine a world leader roaming the streets at night, somewhat disguised, visiting brothels and bars to pick fights with the citizens. On one occasion, Nero, disguised, went out at night, began to molest a woman whose husband happened to be there. Her husband was actually a member of the Roman Senate, and he beat Nero up, rescued his wife. Back at the palace, Nero laid low for a while because of his injuries and all the while he's wondering if that senator had recognized him because Nero had recognized the senator and unfortunately that senator then sent a note of apology admitting he had recognized the emperor only after it was too late and Nero had him immediately executed he wanted a larger palace, didn't have available land. He sets a portion of the empire on fire, and then he blames the Christians so he can build. And persecution begins to unfold in an entirely new chapter. This is the kind of violent ocean upon which the believers have set sail. Isaiah said, and it's true, the wicked are like this troubled sea. Well, this is one hurricane season. The waves must have been enormous and the situation nearly unbearable. And to them and to us, Paul says this amazing thing, be at peace with them. Demonstrate to them what you have received from God. That's an interesting text. In fact, I want to take you to a couple of them. That's one of them. So turn to Romans chapter 12. Let me show you two conditions to that command. I happen to love the realism of the Holy Spirit who inspired these texts. This is the breath of God. But it isn't a book of, you know, strange piety and fake smiles. This is real, and it deals with real life. Notice the beginning of the verse. Here's the first condition, Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Look at the first 
A couple of words. If possible, <laughs> if possible, be at peace. Why would, why would Paul start off by writing that condition? Well, because peace isn't always possible. The gospel sometimes brings a sword. It divides the family. Truth may hurt. And some people, frankly, because of who you are as a Christian, would rather argue with you than make peace or receive peace from you. They'd rather fight you than reach a settlement. You, you didn't try it to do it. You didn't want to do it, but they're on the job. All you did was bow your head and, and, and invite the guy across the table to, to pray with you before lunch. And he reacted with incredible fury and, and who do you think you are? And now you can't even eat your sandwich in peace. You didn't ask for it. It just happened because of who you are and what you believe. It might be a neighbor. Uh, listen, every time I preach, every time I preach, I potentially add to a growing list of enemies. And I hear from them periodically. Not inside here, of course. Out there, being on the internet and radio, I hadn't helped. Got a letter a couple of weeks ago from a man who demanded I go back on the radio and apologize for what I said about what he believed or what I said. And then a few days ago, uh, another letter with a lot of material that I needed to read so that I could correct my statements about this particular cult this individual was in and apologize. A couple of days ago, a lady from another state called in, tried to find me. I wasn't there. I don't stay there. Besides, I would have been in hiding if I'd known she'd called. But at any rate, she called and demanded an apology for what I said about animals. I think it was cats. I think that was the issue. <laughs> But it's in the Bible, i got to preach it. So what can I, what can I do? Now, the truth is, the further along we go, the more people there are out there who are not interested in peaceful relations with Christians who hold to the truth of Scripture. And you've discovered the same thing in your own testimony, which is why it's so important to notice that Paul writes, if possible. If possible. Notice the second condition. If possible, so far as it depends on you. Now, why write that? Well, because it isn't always dependent on you. It, it might be an angry neighbor or a, an unreasonable or jealous coworker. You got the promotion. You, the boss applauded you at the company picnic or whatever, and they now hate you. It isn't up to you. Some people are determined to be your enemy regardless of how you choose to respond or behave in offering them peace. Some people, frankly, enjoy a fight. They would rather harass than unite. See, peace is a two-way street. What Paul is simply telling us is that we need to make sure that our side of the street is open for traffic. It's open and available. Make, make sure you're not the one doing the harassing because of your own personal feelings. Make sure you're the one not resentful. Make sure you're the one not angry. Make sure you're the one who's not bitter. Make sure you're the one who's not refusing to forgive. In fact, notice what Paul writes next. Look at verse 19. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And he writes that in the context of what we've just looked at. In other words, you pursue peace with people that you know as unbelievers are going to stand before God one day. And God will effectively settle every score. Paul adds that here. And I think that would have been especially meaningful to Christians who are persecuted. And we're really not compared to them. And for these who are persecuted to such an extent, he wanted to remind them that one day the world will be judged. One day they will begin to pay as they experience the wrath of God. That kind of long-term perspective, by the way, keeps the unbeliever from becoming your enemy. The object of your hatred. And it keeps them as the object of your pity and your prayer and your passionate outreach. 
he never really becomes your enemy because you understand that as long as he's breathing, he's your mission field. So in the meantime, offer them as much of a peaceful and gracious response as you can. You're offering them the gospel of peace. You're approaching them with your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You're offering them this peace treaty that Christ paid for. And the Holy Spirit through you is offering to them. And the Holy Spirit then works through you as the messenger of peace, demonstrating through your life that attribute of fruit which is only found in Him, for He gives you the fruit of peace. Galatians 5.22 So God isn't saying to these Roman believers or us, you know, to just keep away from the world. You got, you got to be at peace, so, so you need to stay away from them. Uh, you need to buy some land and maybe some other Christians go in with you and you build a little commune. You, you stay away from the world, you, they, they don't like you, and so you, you need to just escape. That, that isn't biblical. In fact, that became institutionalized in what we think of as monasteries. I'm going to find peace alone. That's not what Paul is suggesting. This is our, our mission field. This is why we've been placed on the planet by the grace of God. In fact, notice verse 20. But if your enemy, notice that, not a stranger or your neighbor, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals of fire upon his head. Maybe you're thinking, I like that burning coals part. Now he's speaking my language. Not really. If you look carefully at this verse, you can understand the positive responses, can't you, as a believer, of feeding your enemies, of giving water to your enemies. But this last response of heaping coal seems out of place. It seems negative, and we don't understand it, and we don't understand it because we've never carried around coals on top of our head. But in Paul's day, they did. They didn't have matches above the kitchen sink, you know, to start a fire. They didn't have matches out by the grill on the deck. If somebody didn't keep their fire going, or at least keep some coals hot in their little clay ovens inside their homes, which, upon which they cooked and which heated their homes at, at night, they wouldn't be able to keep warm and they wouldn't be able to eat. If, if for some reason, uh, perhaps as a result of being away or maybe being ill, Maybe some of the herd got loose and they spent a day chasing them down and they got back and, and their coals had turned to dark, cold ash. The quickest way to solve the problem would be to go to a neighbor for some live coals from their stove. And if the neighbor was kind, they'd put, you know, a couple of coals into a container that you might have brought and then you'd balance it on your head in that typical fashion and you'd go back to your own. It'd be really kind if you're in the place of providing the coals to give your enemy a coal or two from your oven. If you did, that would help them. However, there may be some distance they'll have to travel. They might not make it home with hot coals. And even if they did, it's going to take a long time to get that fire back started so they can cook. And their little huts are still going to be cold. So Paul is telling us to respond here, not just with kindness, but with abundant grace. Notice... You are literally heaping coals of fire in that container they're going to balance on their head as they walk home. So they, when they get back home, no time at all. They got, a, they got the fire going and they got the oven hot and they have food ready. And then their little huts are warm. See, the implication for the believer that Paul is making, making here is that you, you're, you're to heap grace upon them. And it's going to be hard. It might not solve everything. It may not fix everything. But it's going to be hard for someone to remain your enemy when you graciously help them rebuild their fire. Just came to my mind. I'll throw this in here. Robert Chapman, who pastored during the days of Spurgeon. Spurgeon said he was the saintliest man he'd ever met. He was a single man all of his life pastored a little tiny church in England. And he lived in a community where one of 
The grocers just hated him because of his gospel. In fact, he would walk by that man's little shop, and that man, if he was near the door, would spit at Robert Chapman. He said nothing kind about him for years. On one occasion, Robert Chapman had guests unexpectedly, and, and he needed groceries, and this couple and family that was staying with him volunteered to go buy it, and he said, well, I'll tell you what, I want you to travel across town because I want you to buy groceries from this man's stand. And they did, and they needed them delivered, and this grocer said, and to whom shall I deliver them? And they said, to Pastor Chapman. And that was such a stunning thing to this man. You talk about heaping coals of fire on this grocer's head, that that man did indeed come to Chapman, confess, and hear the gospel, and he was saved. It may happen, but I can tell you how it would be less likely to happen if our neighbor shows up and we throw coals at him. Heap them. Help them rebuild their fire, effectively rebuild their lives. One author wrote it this way, we're not reactionaries to our culture, we are peacemakers. And I, I would agree, and it's, it's important for the church to understand that. We're, we're not panicking. We can talk about the sin and the immorality of our culture as we prepare to deliver the gospel to it and be very aware of what's happening. We are preparing, and we are praying, and we are serving. And, and we're working in our jobs. We're living in our communities with, with such distinctive lives that offer grace that the unbeliever scratches their head. We're not offensive just to be offensive. Sometimes the truth offends. But we're not angry or resentful. Just as Paul never shares any resentment or any kind of personal anger against Nero. In none of his letters will you find that. In fact, let me show you. Turn uh, to the right and head to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, chapter 2. We looked at this in an earlier promise we're making as members of this church to pray for our leaders and those in authority over us. But now I want to go to the next phrase that I left out purposely because I wanted to get to it now. Go back to verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. First of all then, or here's your priority, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. That's great. Who are you thinking of, Paul? Well, for kings. Oh, that's Nero. And all who are in authority. That's the Senate. In order, now here's what I want you to see, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life with all godliness and dignity. A tranquil and quiet life. And maybe you're in and out of airports every day and you're traveling, you're working 60, you know, 70 hour weeks and you're thinking, <laughs> I would love a little tranquility. You know, maybe you're chasing, you know, uh, two elementary school kids around the house and you haven't had a quiet moment in six years and except at 2 a.m. and even that's not guaranteed and you're thinking tranquility a woman who blogs now serving on the mission field talked about how as a teenager and I read it she said her family would take these cross-country trips on summer vacation and that just kind of took me back to our family of six dra driving from Norfolk, Virginia to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we'd do it in 24 hours, and I thought it was just because we liked to. And then I realized there wasn't any money to spend the night anywhere, and so we would literally drive. We'd start in the evening and get there the next evening. Well, four boys and a mom and a dad, and she described this, and it took me back there, but she said they had this little trick. What they did as they traveled across country to keep the peace, she wrote, we each were allowed to take a turn choosing a cassette to play in the card tape deck. Now this is going to date our cassette. That's a little rectangular thing with two holes in the middle for those of you who are young. Okay? No one in the family was allowed to complain about the choice of cassette that one of the siblings chose or parents. They got their turn as well. They had to listen quietly and try to enjoy it. She said everybody you know, always anxiously awaited their 90 minutes, their turn. She said, especially my father. 
He always put in a 90 minute tape that was still blank. <laughs> 90 minutes of silence. <laughs> I could have used that cassette a long time ago. Well, is that what Paul was talking about? You know, pray for the king and he'll leave you alone and you'll have silence. It'll be helpful to know that Paul isn't out of touch with the first century or the 21st century. In fact, these, are, these words are from the Holy Spirit. The peace and tranquility that Paul is referring to here is that internal focus on the sovereignty of God over kings and over nations and over authorities and certainly culture at large that nothing in life can happen outside his divine purposes so surrendering to his his sovereign purposes as they roll out to us with thanksgiving from this text is the principle that produces internal tranquility and quietness nothing in your life surprise god even though outside there is nothing but swelling of waves and wind and surf on your little boat. It reminded me of the Apostle Peter who was in that boat with the other disciples in the middle of a storm. And you remember, if you're old enough in the faith, of the, the narrative where Jesus comes walking on top of the water and having crossed that water now in a boat some time ago, I just picture what it must have been like for Peter to call out and say, if that's you, Lord, let me come to you. And Jesus said, come on. And he clambers over the side of that boat and walks on top of the water. And then he looks around. Maybe it's a big gust of wind or some spray in his face and he focuses on the circumstances and, and he begins to sink and then he prays that short but very effective prayer. Lord, save me. And the Lord reaches down and pulls him back up and they walk back together. And it occurs to me that he learned what we have to learn and relearn and then relearn all over again. Even though... Perhaps because of our own failure, the water tends to go over our heads. It is still underneath his feet. Everything in life that seems to be over your head is under his sovereign feet. This inner tranquility... Paul writes to Timothy, it ought to be marked by two things, godliness and dignity. In other words, a godly demeanor, a gracious bear, bearing. That doesn't mean you're a killjoy and you can't laugh and enjoy life. It's talking about don't be crass, coarse, off color. Be dignified. Live up to your calling as a believer. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God. Verse 3, notice, who desires all men to be saved. This is the desire of every believer who reflects the character of, of God. And this is why this disposition is so important. These people are not our enemies. They're our mission field. We, we want them to be saved. We are the ambassadors carrying forward the terms of peace with God. They may not like it because it calls for total and unconditional surrender. But we offer the terms. We're not fighting the world. I, I bristle and have for my entire ministry when I hear the term culture war. We're not at war with our culture. We're not angry with our world. We don't hate this world. We are begging this world, as Paul wrote, to be reconciled with God. And no matter what the challenge is, no matter how hot the fire, we respond with grace. We are feeding we are delivering water, the bread of life, the water of life, and tangible water and bread too. And we're pointing people to the one who came to pay the ransom for the treaty that we can now have with God through his blood and cross work. No matter how hot it gets, our mission doesn't change. When you came into the auditorium this morning, unless you came in perhaps maybe one of these doors, I'm not sure, you, you, you received a coffee bean and you put it in your pocket or your purse. Pull it out and take a look at it. You 
In an online pastor's journal that I subscribe to, one pastor told the story of a young lady who was complaining to her father in his church, and he shared the story, and I thought this would be a great place to, to conclude with these promises as it relates to our personal life, our church life, and our community life. So let me share it with you. She said to her father, you know, I, all these problems I'm, I'm having, it's like I solve one and, and, I, and, and I have another one start. And all of us who are older say, well, you know, that never changes. Uh, we have made a commitment, though, I don't know if you're like me, to deal with only one crisis at a time. That's the plan. She says, I'm just weary of it. Her father, who was a chef, and they were talking in the restaurant, uh, took her back to an area in the kitchen where he filled three pots, three small pots with water. And he placed each pot on, on high heat, high fire. Soon the pots came to a boil. In one, he placed some carrots. In another, he placed some eggs. And in the third, he placed a handful of coffee beans. And then just talked to her as if he wasn't really doing anything, and they chatted for a while. And, and then rather impatiently, she said, Okay, Dad, what's up with the pots on the stove? He went over and turned off the burners. He fished out the carrots, and he placed them in a bowl, and he fished out an egg, put it in a little bowl, and then he poured some of the coffee into a cup. And turning to his daughter, he said, he said Sweetie, tell me, tell me what you see. She said, well, I see carrots and an egg and, and coffee. And he said, no, look, look closer. And he handed her a fork and he said, he said, investigate the carrots. What are they like? And she pressed on them and, of course, they were mushy and soft. He said, break that egg. And she broke it and it was no longer uh, runny and soft, but it was hard. And he said, now the third. And she took a sip of that rich coffee and just kind of smiled but she still said dad you know what's what's the point of this he explained to her that each of these elements had faced the same fire the same adversity the same challenge but each of them had reacted to it differently the carrot went in strong firm but after being subjected to the heat, it became flimsy and mushy and weak. The egg was fragile. Its thin outer shell had protected, however, its soft interior. But after sitting in the boiling water, its insides had grown hard. The coffee beans were unique. By being in the boiling water, subjected to fire and heat, they had changed the flavor of the water. Now the room was filled with an aroma and the taste of rich coffee. The father looked at his daughter and asked, which one are you going to become? Do we end up flimsy and weak? Do we grow hardened on the inside? Or will we, and I believe this is Paul's same question here, because of heat and adversity and challenge and chores and responsibilities, instead become an influence by means of what we are on the inside who dwells within us. I want you to take this coffee bean and place it on your desk or your counter at home or, or work. Put it somewhere where you'll see it often. Let it serve as a reminder that God never intended your circumstances or your culture to change you, but for you to influence your culture by means of the aroma of God through Christ. In fact, Paul would write to the Corinthians this wonderful text. He said this, but thanks be to God, who always leads us in a procession of triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma 
of the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 2. This is our distinctive purpose in the world. This is not the time or the place to retreat. You know, to go back to life when it was simple. This is a time for us to face the fire, the pressure, but with this kind of demeanor, this kind of spirit, this kind of disposition, we are peacemaking, dignified, concerned, humble people. And we, by the grace of God, fill our world with the rich aroma of Christ. More than ever before, beloved, this has to be our promise and our commitment to our culture. This is our promise to them who are outside of this peace treaty with God. And they see in us something distinctive and different and ask. They smell the aroma. They taste the flavor of our lives. And we deliver to them the terms of peace. And they come to know Christ like we know him. And they give him glory and great honor. May that be our testimony as well.